Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve DeMello, Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. Welcome to today's research exchange. A couple of quick announcements. First, a welcome to our web viewers and a reminder that the I4E Energy Talk this Friday is on smart grid and technology integration at Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Misha Pavel today. Misha is currently a program director at the National Science Foundation in charge of the Smart Health and Wellbeing Program. Concurrently, he's a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering with a joint appointment in the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology at the Oregon Health Science University. His current research is focused on technology that would enable transformation of healthcare to be proactive, evidence-based, distributed, and patient-centered. Please join me in welcoming Misha Pavel. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure. I have lots of friends here, and it's nice to be back in California. Uh, today, I'm going to divide the talk into four parts. And uh, uh, first two will be very quick, and then we uh, focus on some uh, more uh, interesting uh, technical aspects. So I will ha I am wearing two hats today. The first one is my, as I'm here as a uh, NSF program director, but I'm also here as a researcher. And it's important that you know that uh, the uh, aspects of the talk that are related to real technical issues are not necessarily opinion of uh, NSF. And in fact, sometimes I very much differ from my colleagues at NSF. Um, so uh, everybody knows that healthcare is in trouble and that we need to change it. Um, I'm not going to go through the details. By the way, the reason why I'm going to go through this uh, first uh, group of slides fairly fast is that we will very soon put it up on a web. We, we have just run a webinar on... Uh, April 18th, and that webinar will be put on the uh, on the web, and we will be a you will be able to look at the details in uh, in your in the comfort of your home. Um, here is one example why we are in trouble. This is the cost. Uh, United States is in black here, and other countries are in the other colors. And as you can see, we are spending much more per capita in terms of the proportions or in terms of real dollars than any other country, almost twice as much. And yet, when we look at the results, we are not doing very well. We are on the order of 30th in many of the measures that you can use for in healthcare. So this is not, and this kind of exponential growth is not sustainable for sure. The other thing that's happening is that um, has to do with the dependency ratio. That's the proportion of old people, like me, to people who actually work. And this is going to change drastically. In fact, we call it silver tsunami. And one of the reasons why you young people have to worry is that the generation of people that are in that tsunami is the boomers, and we are very selfish, and we don't take no for an answer. So, you, you, you make you, you can be sure that terrorism is nothing compared to what we will do to this country if we don't solve the problem. Now, this has been recognized by a number of bodies, and here are some examples. This is the um, President Councils of Advisors for Science and Technology published two reports in 2010. One of them is directly related to health information, and it's kind of more near term, and the other one is the review of the NIDR, and that has a, a number of other areas, like including energy and, traffic and uh, transportation, but both of them are good reading in order for you to understand where the government is going, and that's useful if you want to have funding. Um, the program that I'm directing has, uh, are, has been motivated in part by a lot of other visionary uh, activities, including the uh, 
uh, including NR, uh, the Institute of Medicine and other NRC pro pro uh, reports and so on. Again, good reading. You'll see it. You can back, go back to this on, on the uh, web. Now, this uh, environment or this background gave rise to this program that used to be called Smart Health and uh, Wellbeing. Now, this year has been changed to Smart and Connected Health, and it's this time joint program with NIH. And that was, it took me a long time to get that done, and it was an interesting experience how things work in Washington when you want to have two agencies working together. Um, here is the uh, more graphical representation of the kind of transformation that we need to make to healthcare. As I mentioned previously, we need to go from episodic and reactive and, and disease-oriented to proactive and predictive. We have to go from hospital-centric to patient-centric, from medicine that's based on training and experience, and we can get into the details if you'd like to later, on more evidence-based, and uh, including fragmented local data have to be used in the evidence-based approaches to be, make them interoperable. And most very important and often ignored aspect is that naive passive patients have to be converted to active participants in their own care that both increases the effectiveness and decreases cost, as has been shown. This is the view of a patient-centered approach that will bring about the issues that have to do with technology. Patient at the center, on the right, we are making assessment, we measure, we sense, and we sense anything from physiology to behaviors, and including patients' input in, uh, the, in case of uh, personal health records, and definitely HR. On the right, we have interventions. And again, interventions is not just get, you go to the doctor and, uh, and are treated, but include devices, family, self-care. And that there has to be a very effective infrastructure that needs to be built that includes mobile health. And I cannot say enough about how mobile health is going to help us transform uh, the energy, uh, the, the um, healthcare delivery. This is an example of, of, uh, of the uh, approach. Uh, you might want to refer to a paper that we wrote, uh, sort of a little bit of position paper, very short piece, that takes a, even a young person can be, benefit from being monitored. And in for case of young people, it's more for performance and, and uh, healthy well-being. And for older people, it's for for care. Mobile technology then is connected to the back, uh, back end office and of course um, it can be used for intervention as well and uh, we can't forget the uh, fact that everything now is in cloud <laughs> computing. Um, this is a, a slide I stole from, uh, from Jay Snyder. We often know more about our car then we know about ourselves, and wouldn't be nice if we had, if we had as proactive care as we have with the car. So then, when your red light goes on, the idiot light goes on. Something's wrong. You take it to the dealer usually, and uh, but when you get sick, you wait till much longer till you really have symptoms before you go to a clinician. Here are the. Uh, four components of, uh, of the program that are used here more as an example of the technological and technical aspects of the smart and connected health that we are looking at. We are looking at informatics and digital information infrastructure, as I mentioned before. I will tell a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides, but it has to integrate EHRs, electronic health records, and probably will require something of the sort of semantic representation, fusion, and so on. And you can see how this gets into real computer science issues that have not yet been solved. Um, data to knowledge, is, uh, big data are not useful unless you can use them in actual point of care. And how to do that is going to require a lot of work. And 
very fundamental work as well. Empowering individuals I already mentioned, but um, I, we will hear a lot about that because most of the end of the talk, the second part of the talk will be about behaviors. And sensors and devices, which we call cyber-physical um, infrastructure, is going to be obviously a component, ranging from sensors to robotics. And when I talk about robotics, I don't necessarily mean the humanoid kind of robots, but any kind of devices that work with intelligent way with humans. Um, the impo this is, for example, of uh, the kind of challenge we face. The, the be sense devices will be and the databases will be available to get information from, but in order to actually use it at the point of care for decisions, you have to be able to transform those into some kind of uh, form that, are, that enable us to fuse it, calibrate, and adapt to the decision that needs to be made. And I call that um, source invariant decision base making. And the idea is that you can hopefully transform, maybe it's not possible everywhere, but transform data from one source to another. And you would be surprised, those of you who haven't looked at it, how difficult it is to get even two hospitals that you, or systems that have the same uh, electronic health record like uh, EPIC to talk to each other because each configuration is enough different that the definitions do not necessarily transform directly. And so that's why you need to have kind of semantic representation potential with meta tagging, data provenance, and all of those things that we um, are struggling with in the data uh, information systems. The other problems that, uh, that um, you may not have thought about is the issue with uh, randomized control trials. And here is the, what goes on. Suppose that in 2005, um, you uh, decide to test one of the PDAs, or, uh, sort of digital, uh, digital devices. So you submit a grant and you actually get funded. In those deals, you could get funded. Then in 2006, you develop pilots, then you recruit and randomize, then you actually do follow-up, and finally, you may actually publish it. So this was, uh, this took about, what, six years? And uh, that's pretty fast, actually, for randomized trials. So what happened during that time? YouTube came, <laughs> came on, iPhone, Android, iPad. So if you test something, the, the technology that was in 2005, you're probably obsolete. However, can we think about ways of ch transforming randomized control trials to actually utilize technology to make that turnaround ex radic radically faster? And there's some work on that going on, but will require much more. Because you still want to keep the, the ideas behind randomized control trials that give us unbiased results. But you want to make it possible to run much faster. Because you can see that the actual test phase is not that long. It's all of the stuff that goes before and after <coughs> It's taking us that long. So here are some examples of challenges technology-based uh, that uh, um, enable us to transform healthcare. And I'm go not going to spend much time on it, but it includes mobile, as I mentioned, mobile and wearable computing, cyber physical systems. But what I am going to focus on is something that's often ignored, which is the uh, computational predictive models that are absolutely necessary in making it possible to change the healthcare in a dramatic way. Um, the program that we run, the Smart and Connected Health, typically requires two components to it. There is an important component that has to do with uh, um, addressing an important issue in healthcare. So it's very important that actually the healthcare aspect that's addressed is one of the important uh, problems that we are facing. 
and not just that you happen to stumble across some uh, some uh, problem that happens to be solvable by your technology. But then, in contrast to what we typically find at NIH, although that's not true over the, across the board, is that it has to have generalizable <coughs> results in fundamental science. And that can include engineering, computer science, social behavioral science, and so on. So this is pretty broad. This is, these are the uh, three uh, directorates in NSF, engineering, computer science, and social behavior that are involved. And these are the six institutes that within NIH that have signed up to do this this year, but we'll have more next year, sure. Again, here is a, just a very, just 30 second uh, recount of how these proposals will be reviewed. You submit proposal to NSF in a standard NSF form. It will be reviewed by standard NSF panels. However, those panels will be multidisciplinary and will include a couple of uh, one or two uh, scientific review officers from NIH that will then transform the scores that the NSF panels gives to the NIH. And then we get together and decide which of those proposals we would fund each organization. And if NS NIH picks up uh, a program, a proposed, uh, the, the, office, the uh, PI will be contacted and will be asked to resubmit it just with change of format, not the text. So that should be very quick. And when that happens, it's the, there is a high likelihood that, that the proposal would be funded because the N NIH folks will not uh, do extra work if they, they cannot fund it. So if you are in that situation, you would know. Anyway, more details of the process will be in that f webinar. Uh, I would also ad advise you to look at the NSF uh, website, look at awards and search awards, and you can search to see what else we funded in the last two years of the program, the first two years of the program. And uh, we have about uh, 40 different projects and uh, about 60 different organizations that have been working on these problems. Okay, now... The next few minutes I'm going to spend on talking about the kind of challenges that, uh, that we're facing. And we're in three areas, finding important problems. Again, I'm going to emphasize the same thing I said before, organizing multidisciplinary team and recognizing innovative ideas. Those are one of the three key issues that I've been struggling with. So what happens typically is that a researcher has a camera, looks for nails, and then writes a proposal how these nails are very important to the country. And that is so transparent that if you, uh, uh, that, uh, that it's completely clear. And instead, what we would like to have the opposite, find the real problem and then solve it. And this is an issue that uh, um, a lot of people don't recognize until they read somebody else's proposal and they see it's transparent. Another aspect of uh, picking problems here has to do with what's called the Pasteur Quadrant. Um, if those of you have not seen it quickly, there are two, at least two ways that research can be inspired, applications and understanding. So Niels Bohr, for example, didn't care about applications, but... Uh, he was only uh, proposing, uh, working on uh, basic science. Edison is the opposite. He actually discouraged his folks from understanding why certain filaments work better than others because he thought it was a waste of time. Pasteur, on the other hand, did both. And this is the quadrant, Pasteur quadrant, where we want to be. And that's what we would like to f fund. And this is, there's more, more pressure at NSF, NIH, to actually be in this quadrant. And we are trying to do a lot of... I would like to say one more thing about this. Applications are very important, not just because they are actually useful for society, but they actually can drive basic science in a way that basic science alone often doesn't. By asking, by 
first of all, not allowing people to make assumptions that are, that are um, too simplifying. Now, uh, modern era, this Steve Jobs in here, and of course there is a last quadrant, the common man. <laughs> Building transdisciplinary teams is very important, and almost every proposal has to have a transdisciplinary team, at least the collaborators from clinical and, and uh, engineering or technical science, and creating those teams are not, is not easy. The reason why we call it transdisciplinary is that the teams have to be acculturated. They have to really understand each other's work, work enough to be able to understand what the, the depth of the problems, and there are a lot of ways to do that. I, one thing that people don't do enough is to run seminars, cross-cutting uh, seminars, where you ask the engineer to present the clinical papers, and the clinicians present the engineering papers. And that forces people to think about the way the other group thinks. How do you know you succeed at? Well, if people laugh at the same jokes, so engineers like the Dilbert jokes that have to do with clouds, and uh, when you actually when you mention platform, then you are a real philosopher. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, life scientists like the Gary Larson's jokes, and this is the time for the brainstorming, uh, STEM brainstorming. Um, the other thing that's difficult is to recognize innovation. This is a, uh, something I stole from Jay Snyder. This is a quote from London Times, 1834. This will never come into general use. Of course, it's obviously a uh, useless device. What is he talking about? The stethoscope. Well, finally, after 150 years, we again think it's obsolete now, but uh, for 150 years, it did a very good job. Uh, this is another cartoon that... Uh, uh, and it tells you that it's very difficult to become innovative on command, but there is a way to structure the environment to be innovative. Anyway, all right, let's focus on behavior, big data, and predictive modeling. Why are behaviors? Well, if you look at behaviors, they are actually huge determinants of uh, health. In case, this is a paper from McGinnis. 40% of uh, our premature mortality can be traced to behavioral, ranging from obesity, uh, congestive heart failure, um, uh, cardiovascular problems, cancer, and so on, smoking. Um, the, uh, obesity is a particularly uh, difficult problem because it's really rapidly increasing, and this is one place where the United States is way ahead of everybody, but uh, other countries are catching up quickly. Uh, we have... Uh, it's the first time, possibly, in history that our life expectancy may turn downward if we look at the predictions of what's happening because of that, those kind of issues. Of course, it's very difficult to make the right choices because we are facing all of these wonderful <laughs> food, uh, food and so on. Now, there are other drivers that... Uh, that uh, make behavior very important. Economics, being able to actually make judgment, enable building models that are predictive, actually require us to know how people make decisions. The um, epidemiology of public health often does not uh, take into account behaviors, but diseases will spread depending on behaviors. And this is not true just of HIV, but even flu and other uh, diseases. The, the washing hands is not just important to do in a hospital, but also in, in, uh, in normal life. Finally, rob robotics and building interactive robots and machine, human machine interfaces require us to really understand the state of the human and learn to perform human behaviors. So, for example, this is a um, funded pro project that we fund by Alterwitz, where the robot is learning to help elders to put shoes on. You would be surprised how difficult it is to put shoes on when you have real severe arthritis. Um, the other uh, work is play, uh, playing with children and uh, social robotics, and that's just beginning to be um, investigated. Again, 
just to remind you, this kind of mobile health is going to generate a lot of data, and uh, uh, we will have to deal with that. I also want to acknowledge you uh, collaborators that will be involved in the foot. I'm going to say next. They range, there has a huge OHSU team uh, as well as UC uh, Berkeley team. Um, and what you, some of the data that you will see come from those, uh, those that work. Uh, in Orcatech in uh, Oregon, we have about 200 homes that we furnished with sensors and we're sensing everything from moving, uh, people moving around, computer use, uh, medication taking, and so on, as much as we can. But it has to be very cheap, because if you have 200 homes and you, uh, you have $5,000 per home, that's a million dollars, right? So uh, you can't do it very easily, that, uh, unless you really do it on cheap, which is why we use the here is one thing that I would like to point to you that I'm going to use later. This corridor is equipped with several of the motion sensors. And we use that to actually monitor speed. And I'll tell you about that, speed of walking. These are actual data uh, from one person, one, one year of life. Each day is a circle. Each color is the different sensor. And... Um, you have 24 hours a day. So starting at midnight, this is night, and this is uh, during the day. You see this person actually uh, goes to the kitchen, that's the purple, makes breakfast, lunch, and dinner. First half a year she slept well, then something happened here. If I don't have a chance to talk about sleep, it's hugely important, and we really need to focus on how to... Uh, understand it and help people. This other person is, uh, actually lives in a retirement community and she goes out every, every uh, three times a day and actually socializes. So it may not be the best thing to, for people to live in their homes because they may be more isolated than if they live in community. Now, uh, I don't know if I can get this working, but you, uh, to understand what's happening in somebody's life, um, here we go. You can actually visualize this, and I, I'm just doing this very fast, but you can see uh, periods when the person is out of the home, and you have to be able to actually get, get view. And so visualization of big data is a really important uh, component of that. But big data by themselves are going to be, go only that far. We will really need to bring, build computational predictive models in order to make them um, make it useful, make big data useful at point of care. That's, the reason is that big data tells about population, but we usually have very small data about individuals, and it's that friction that needs to be solved, and that model, modeling is the only way to solve it. And let me um, just jump into uh, 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 this slide that not only we need to do modeling, computational predictive modeling, but we also need to focus on the individual. I call it model me. We are, it has to be a multi-scale approach that ranges from molecular biology all the way to economics. And what I found in my life, since I have been moving along this axis, is that everybody who works anywhere in, in, along, these, uh, along this axis say in physiology, finds that the level that they use is the most important one. Everything below worries about two, uh, two small uh, insignificant issues, and everybody above them is too fluffy. As I said, model me, modeling individual is important because you don't want to have surgeon go and operate on some average head if you have a brain tumor. This is, happens to be my MRI, but uh, I want them to practice on my model, not on the model of average or another cadaver. Um, here is a an, an nice representation of, of why we need to model individuals as opposed to... A, this, was a, this, this is an informal study of speed of typing and errors. And what we found is that these are different subjects 
that as uh, the subject increases in speed, uh, the errors go down. This is unexpected, right? Well, indeed, it is unexpected and it's wrong because each individual person has speed accuracy trade-off. The faster you type, the more likely you make an error. But the faster typists are usually better and make fewer errors. Okay, so over population there is a decline, but for individual it's increased. If you don't understand this, you're going to make the conclusion. This is just a simple case uh, to illustrate it. I'm going to skip. Uh, but this is an important slide. That, uh, it has to do with, in general, approach to modeling that, um, that we need to understand. Big data, as typically conceived, are generally thought of uh, approaching the problem with very few assumptions, uh, basically data-driven. Um, the model that we have there are very, very unconstraining, low constraints. We call them weak models, typically, in, uh, in kind of mathematical, statistical sense. However, they are there. Even the ability to compute average requires you to make a distributional assumption. If you don't have distribution, you can't compute average. Why, why, why should you add numbers? Why shouldn't we multiply them? Um, regression is a little stronger, and so on and so forth. Data driven. On the other hand, on the opposite side, you have completely phenomenological model. They are based on uh, understanding of the underlying processes. And some people like uh, Epstein, uh, Joshua Epstein, and Johns Hopkins calls them explanatory versus predictive. It's not quite right because the regression models are also predictive, but in a different sense. I don't have time to go into details, but I do want to carry you through this one example of astronomy. And uh, uh, in, uh, Pythagoras thought that spheres were very, uh, the ideal shapes, and that led to many think that, uh, that uh, all the, the astronomy is uh, based on circles, and, but actually, we had a heliocentric system 300 years ago, uh, 300 years BC, which was forgotten. But Ptolemy came up with this notion of Earth in the center, but the planets actually are uh, moving around uh, some equant. And from that, he actually developed a model. This was 150 years BC. Now, 1,500 years later, 1,500 years later, people started questioning. This is not quite true. This is the Western civilization. The Arab uh, uh, Muslim uh, astronomers have, have been challenging that for a little earlier. But for 1,500 years here, okay, then comes Copernicus, who still has uh, circularity, and, but is uncomfortable with the equant uh, um, and the epicycles. Uh, then Giordano Bruno, he didn't get tenure. That's a bad joke. Uh, but think of Tycho de Brahe. Tycho de Brahe actually spent many, many days or nights in the observatory and created big data. And those big data were used to actually improve that Ptolemy model. A Ptolemy model, you can ask, why did it last 1,500 years? Well, Ptolemy model was able to explain the questions, answer the questions that were asked. It could even predict eclipses. Right? But it, was, it had a lot of parameters, and it was basically fitting, overfitting the model. Then, of course, Kepler and Galileo came along, and Kepler came up with other empirical laws. Now, these are somewhat simpler, less precise and simpler, but it's still empirical. You can still cannot predict what happens to an object with given velocity and position. And it wasn't until Newton that we were able to take any object now and compute its, uh, its trajectory in the space. And this is the predictive model. Now, medicine, we are still in this gap. And even with the big data, if, don't, if we don't focus on, be, on, on modeling uh, the principles, we'll be still improving Ptolemic models of medicine. Um, this is uh, just the black box models, the regression. I'm not going to spend any time on it. But here is an example of, um, of modeling that is principled, but it doesn't require you know, to really understand the processes. That has to do with 
uh, uh, looking at invariances, for example, homogeneity, additivity, and stuff like that. In linearity, for example, is a combination of homogeneity and, and uh, additivity. Um, these are very powerful ways of incorporating principles that underlie behaviors in or, uh, or uh, any kind of processes in uh, building predictive models. This is uh, uh, some, uh, these are some examples. For example, scale invariance is a homogeneity of zeros order. If you take, take any object and multiply all the dimensions by the same number, it's still the same object, right? Those invariances are very powerful in what they can do for us. And I will talk a little bit about, uh, in, in law, in perception, those of you who are psychologists, the just noticeable difference is actually the um, first order homogeneity law. Body mass index, what's this all about? That's an example of a, of a homogeneity second order. You can multiply your, if you take health person with certain health status and multiply his height by, by a number squared, that will, and the weight by, a lambda, by, by that number, so this, this is squared, this is the number, the health state is the same. So two people, that have any relationship like that should have the same state. And that, of course, can, from that you can derive that uh, BMI principle. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this, that this is much easier to establish empirically than actually doing scaling. And that, there's the power of these kind of laws, the modeling laws. Um, of course, this implies that uh, the, the, the third dimension actually is invariant. So if you get taller, you don't get the, if you want to be healthy, you want to keep the stomach the size the same. And in fact, there is some evidence that the perimeter is just as informative as BMI. It turns out that there is, it's not exactly, there's probably a lot of deviations, but another pro point here is this is body fat and uh, versus BMI. So body fat seems to be more important and and you see that there is a lot of variation. So the BMI is not as predictive as we would hope. You have to be more better. These are, um, this is the homogeneity in weight and variability in weight. Typically, if you have congestive heart failure, people tell you, well, if you gain two pounds in two days, you should uh, call us, right? Well, it depends what your weight is. If your weight is 250 pounds, as this, this person here, then two pounds a day is just a random variation of every day, right? So the thresholds that you're setting have to be... But there is this homogeneity that is proportional to the, uh, to the uh, average weight. This I'm going to skip. This is the fact that uh, Google was able to predict, uh, to detect um, uh, epidemic before CDC. Here I'm going to go into uh, behavioral aspects of, that has to do with walking. Um, as I mentioned before, we have uh, these sensors in people's home, and it turns out that speed of walking is determinant not only of your ability to move around, but also your cognition. This is very important, because we haven't done enough research on finding out what is it about gait that actually enables you to, or connects us to this, with the uh, uh, cognition. And so what we did, we, these are the actual data, this one person, the, this is a distribution of velocity, so um, the average is somewhere here, and you see this person is declining. This is the uh, time well, measure, measured for about three years, and you can see the decline. We could detect it, and in fact, the person was uh, diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment at that age. And you could have uh, already predicted it from the behavior early on during the study. This person is relatively steady but had a stroke. And what I'm, the reason I'm showing this here is that you can watch the rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is another huge uh, source of cost that would be enabled or helped by uh, behavioral me metrics. And here is just a notion that uh, not only if you start building models of cognition, 
affecting gait. You also have to build in model of sensors, but then you can make inferences about cognition. And here is an example of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a problem. Typically in gait community, people think that gait parameters, like the length of, uh, of step, step size, is determined by minimizing energy. But when you're old, when you're getting to be my age, it's not that. It's my arthritis. It's afraid, I'm afraid because uh, you know, I don't want to fall, and not especially not in front of you. So I'm going to make more small steps. I was planning to do some jumps here, but I decided not to do that. In fact, you can construct an objective function that actually predicts the choice of step size and, <coughs> and cadence and velocity for an individual with certain constraints. And you use these constants, these parameters that you to actually infer the cognitive input. And then you can build a model, hybrid cognitive model, control model, with, where uh, I, I don't have time to explain that in detail, but essentially you have a you have a dynamics, the biomechanics of, uh, of human walk, uh, human uh, body, sensory system that actually senses, and that includes proprioception as well as vision, as, vis as well as vestibular system, and that is fed. Now, when you're walking normally and not think about it, it's automatic. But not automatic, uh, but a cognitive automatic, meaning you're not paying attention to it. The minute you get some deviation from what you expect, like you slip or there's something here or whatever you have to do, then cognitive control kicks in and takes over from the uh, automatic control. And you can build this system to actually uh, try to understand what's the details of that. Now, I'm going to go through this one very fast. Sleep, as I said, is important. We measure that by looking at people... Um, by putting load sensors under the bed and building a model of what happens when you're breathing. And then you can actually measure not only breath, but also heartbeat and uh, detect apnea and things of that sort. But you do need that little model here. Otherwise, you can't do it right. Um, I'm going to split the chair. Let's go skip that. It's, it's a little complicated because many people use using Markov, hidden Markov models, and that's, prob that's wrong in most situations because uh, the time you spend in each state depends on where you came from and what the state is. And uh, it's not necessarily uh, um, exponential distribution, and so you need to do semi-Markov models. Um, the... Second to last, I want to talk about uh, de detecting cognit cognitive processes or estimating cognitive processes based on games and computer interaction. We have, peop we have modeled how people use mouse, and that's very instru instructive and predictive, actually, uh, what's happening. But here I want to show you a very simple. When you use games to infer cognition, you can't just use the score. Because the score depends on the conditions of the game. And sometimes a difficult game can give you poor score even if you're very good and vice versa. So you actually need to build a model. This game is a, the concentration game. You try to match cards. And so you have to remember the location and the identity cards that you've seen. And the model that we have is a simple buffer that's actually leaky. And here um, you get uh, the input is B, A, C, D, like that be ACD, and the buffer is like a push-down buffer, but leaky, meaning at each uh, time uh, of the update, an uh, item can disappear, and uh, you test it by seeing whether the subject responded correctly, recognize repetition, right, See something that they've seen before, and from that, you can actually derive the survival curves for the items in the memory, and that parameterizes your working memory in a way that is very simple and effective. Um, in fact, using those data, we can predict the standard neuropsych tests as well as they can predict each other, meaning uh, if you run the same test twice on a person, you get just as good. Uh, Moreover, you can look at what happens to people over time. And I, again, I'm not going to 
This is the estimation of the buffer size in the memory as a function of time. The last thing I wanted to uh, mention is the notion of obesity. This is uh, Christy, and you can see the reason I put him on is that for him, this obesity, obesity issue is key in becoming president, right? Everybody seems to like him, but people say, oh, he's too fat. And even he cannot... <laughs> So, can we build technology that would enable us to help people like Christy? And what, it, what, what does it take? Deep modeling. On one hand, we have the metabolism model that takes in diet and physical activity and produces lean mass and fat mass. The intake, diet and physical activity, is determined by behavior of the person together with the social norms, environment, economics, etc. The question is, can we somehow introduce feedback loop that would actually make it useful? So on this side, we can write the equations for metabolism. I'm not going to go through that. These are very long term. But they are not impossible to do. Um, for behavior change, we can, uh, there, are, there is enough evidence in social and behavioral uh, sciences that uh, to tell us the, the relationship between the state of the person that's not directly observable and the kind of uh, outputs that are like physical exercise, responses to questionnaire and so on. Depending on which state the person is, we can optimize the message, the intervention. So if you if you're pre-contemplative stage, you, you think there's no problem with you being a little bit heavy. There's nothing I can do and help uh, giving you uh, instructions about which exercise to do is not going to help. I have to do something very different with you. And this is uh, then optimization of this control system that requires fairly sophisticated insights and understanding. And this is actually my way. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to say that I could use intervention there. <laughs> As I got a little bit heavy in the first part of April, I um, don't know why, maybe I was drinking too much. <laughs> and we, have, we actually have a system. I have, I'm hurrying because we have to finish the system that actually incorporates this into the, uh, the uh, complete closed loop. And this is a part that we're doing with the Rujana Baichi and uh, exercises for older people at home. So, take home messages. Healthcare needs to be changed. There's no question about it. Model first, ask questions later. <laughs> it's very important that even when you are doing um, hypothesis extraction or abduction, you still have a model in your mind. Because if you don't, it's likely to, uh, the space is too big. Uh, you have to focus on individual. This is where I'm having a hard time convincing my fellows because they are really uh, sort of... Uh, So, do not want to go into that uh, arena for a variety of reasons. Multi-scale models must uh, include behaviors and context, otherwise we will make wrong decisions, and we need to do that by forming transdisciplinary teams. These are my colleagues, and we're just scratching the surface here. Thank you. <laughs>